Hello, my name is Michael Morris and I'm the superintendent of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District and welcome to the latest episode of Window Winter ARPS. I'm thrilled today to be joined by a student leader and a staff member to talk about an exciting program um, that's really in its infancy but growing uh, very quickly and we're thrilled to have embedded into our regional school system. So with me is Petru Mukimba who is a sophomore at Amherst Regional High School and Evelina Kino, who is, uh, plays multiple roles for our district, but is in this particular role as the circle facilitator for the restorative justice program at the high school. So welcome to both of you. Um, I want to start by saying this is a, a program that there's a lot of community interest in, uh, and there's a lot of community advoca advocacy for, um, that many people in our community want to see a different way than traditional disciplinary routes um, to support student culture. And I'm just thrilled that I want to thank you both for both of your roles. We've had multiple interactions, including at the school committee this winter, uh, about the work both of you are doing and how it's in, infused into the high school at the current moment. So I want to start with a thank you and acknowledgement. Um, but I also want to start with asking you a question. If you could tell me a little bit about yourself and how you came to be involved with the restorative justice program at the high school. Um, so my name is Petrua Mukemba, and I'm a sophomore at the high school. One thing that I, I love to do at the high school is play basketball. I played on the varsity um, basketball team this year. And uh, so that's basically just about myself. And um, how I got involved in the restorative justice practice was basically um, last year, um, DW, one of the teachers at the school who started it, started up with Eveline, they, um, they came to, up to me and said, like, do you want to try this out? I'm like, oh, okay, sure. And so I um, went to the meeting, and then I got, had to fill out this like, application. And then uh, later that month or year, the year, at the end of the year, we met up, and then I just started joining it, and I've loved it ever since. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Evelyn, can you share a little bit about yourself? Um, my name is Evelyn Aquino, and I am a longtime youth development you know, worker and cultural worker in really bringing about um, spaces for young people to be held and valued and um, partly from my own experience as a young person and um, having wisdom that I didn't feel like was valued as in my youth. And so I've committed a lot of time and energy to young people, um, valuing where they're coming from and their experiences and as an adult creating the spaces and um, holding adults accountable to create space to bring in youth wisdom and value um, for us as a community. So um, coming into it, I was hired as a coach to support DW in developing the work. I have many, many years of doing restorative justice, whether it's in the juvenile halls or running programs outside for marginalized young people, really, that have been pushed out of the system, have dropped out alternative routes. Um, and just um, being able to come and support the, the development of the restorative justice, I, I was not ready to fully commit into a staff position <laughs> around the time of its inf uh, inception, but um, to be able to support DW in developing the work and really um, just being sort of a, uh, a board for her to bounce off some of the ideas that she was doing and, and bring in my wisdom of experience to support the, the, the implementation of the work in the school has been quite rewarding. DW's um, very um, skilled and keen in, in their approach to this work and it was a great teamwork and, and support and I was behind the scenes for a very long time <laughs> until we decided to um, facilitate this class. DW applied for a grant through AEF. Thank you, AEF, for the support. It's really, you can feel the impact with it, being able to start this class as an ALPS. Um, and I came in to support DW around as a scholar. That's the title we used, but really around the theory of restorative justice and restorative practices within a school environment um, and really with a cultural lens um, with it and social justice versus just these questions and you kind of go through it, but really it being a, a humanistic approach um, in, in how we do circle practice. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to do a little translating of acronyms, if that's okay with you. So Amherst AEF is Amherst Education Foundation, and, and to your point, deeply appreciative. And uh, some of the work that happened this year wouldn't have been possible without them supporting us to get the ball rolling with that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and Alps um, is an alternative learning. Um, it's it's an alternative learning experience at the high school. So, as opposed to our traditional course sequence, it allows for more experience, experiential and experimental courses to be offered and experiences to be offered to our students. So, mm -hmm. thank you. I just want to make sure I'm always um, conscious that. of that. And so um, for people who, some people watching this may have some experience with restorative justice, and some people are hearing that term for the first time. So mm -hmm. 
Um, how, how does this work differ from other community-based um, work that you've been involved with? Um, and, and how could you help someone who hasn't heard that term before know what it means? Um, well, on, in our, we have a room that we meet in every day, and in that room we have like posters of words and big like like words that represent what restorative justice is all about. And um, one of the words says, um, one of the posters says paradigm shift. Um, and I think that really kind of like sums up how it's different than from um, most community-based work. Because um, instead of like trying to work with the system that we already live in, the school system and the, the criminal justice systems that we live in, it's, instead it's like taking a different alternate route that can um, help people, victims and help uh, witnesses of injustice um, and really just like it's not like trying to fit into what or is already established but creating a new um, establishment that will work a lot better than what has already worked and helped a lot help a lot more people so restorative justice kind of just helps people who have been um, marginalized and um, oppressed for so long like bl black people um, people of color like Latino people the LGBTQ community, women, and all that in this country that have been oppressed and everything, it helps. And even regular, like white people and um, uh, every, just everyone, in, like work together to like make a better place. And um, I would like to add that it's like, um, it's a Native American uh, process that from a, a long time ago they were uh, they I think originally started this work and uh, they it was like a way of governing themselves and having like restoring the harm that may have been done in the community and trying to rework that to make the world a better place for them and it was banned um, for some time uh, it was banned for some time because of the US government there's I don't know a lot <laughs> about it but it was banned for some time but I think it's back now and it's back in this new way with the restorative justice and it's like I'm really glad that I'm able to be a part of it so yeah I think you'd like to add your sure. perspective. Um, <clears throat> to put it in context of what's the, why it's become so popular, um, we have to go back a little bit to No Child Left Behind and zero tolerance around crime, in particularly in schools. And across the country, many communities um, were getting, um, and, and researchers at universities also, we're really beginning to see this upward mobility, this upward trend around the prisons being full and where, why was this happening? Where is this coming out of? The, the dropout rate, the, the criminalization of young people, it was really off the charts, which we recommend watching 13th because it's part of, it's a documentary on the prison system, but it gives context to why restorative justice was really um, begun in schools was because you know studies had come out that um, if a child was suspended by the fourth grade, um, you know prisons were prison beds were ready for them, and so it has been said and, and research shows that decriminalizing learning opportunities for young people will really change the traje trajectory moving forward. And so across the country, a lot of efforts have been put into. Um, the criminal justice changing, especially with young people, around how the, how we deal with what is crime and who's a criminal, and really moving into um, the human aspect of um, opportunities for growth and learning, um, and with that, you know, the levels of implicit bias and how they play out, but also an opportunity to create a, a mechanism, and as Petro says, a paradigm shift. And, and many, many schools across the country have had incredible success with it. Um, some of the major players that have really been on the, um, in the landscape are Oakland, California, and many, many others after that. And locally, Holyoke High School has done a great job of building up the leadership of the young people and building up the culture of an alternate to suspension um, because of the disproportionate number of young people of color um, and folks with disabilities of those numbers being off the charts around um, um, rules being broken and laws being broken and just an opportunity to be like, what is going on? And, how did we get here and how do we move forward and how do we repair? So in traditional um, uh, discipline and consequence, there's a rule and it was broken and now you're gonna be punished, Whereas, um, which is retributive and restorative is really there's a harm that was caused, who was impacted and how can we move forward from it? Um, so it's not that there's no consequences, it's just the how we're moving forward and dealing with it and really taking a human approach to an opportunity to restore harmony. 
Yeah, and I'll just say from, uh, I'm certainly not where either of you are with the work, but uh, from my perspective has gotten some training. Uh, the thing that also resonates, and it resonates with what both of you said, is it, it's trying to look at situations as learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, the traditional model, there's not a lot of learning that happens mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. that process, and there's a lot of, not a lot of uh, what's done about the harm that's caused, it just, it sort of stays because consequence doesn't actually um, work on the harm piece, it works mm -hmm. on everything but that. Mm -hmm. So um, as an educator, I just appreciate too that we're trying to take an educational lens onto something um, to reform it um, through a learning mechanism instead of a different way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just wanted um, to note that. I yeah. wanted to add, like I was, I, whenever I think about this work, I think about how like if I was to be in trouble for, let's say I got into a fight with another student and then I like go to a guidance counselor and then the guidance counselor says, okay, you're suspended for a couple of days and that's like basically it. Um, and then I would, I know I would feel like, well, that doesn't address anything that happened. And I, what, what happens when I come back in school and I see that person again who uh, made me feel some type of way that made me want to hit that person. And I think, like that kind of thinking that goes through my head with that just even like situational um, situation, like that, um, that's why I like how restorative justice works because it doesn't just like punish the person that made the so-called bad, the bad thing. It also addresses how, what's going on around that person that may affect why they did what they did and really has them an acknowledge like what they, what, what's going on and what's the situation, so yeah. Thank you. So, um, you know, I described your position or part of your position, I should say, as a circle facilitator. So uh, for someone who hasn't been part of a circle before, um, we're not going to do it right now, although I think it's always best to show it as you did at school committee uh, back in December. Uh, that was a really powerful experience for a number of people who were had mm. previously been in a circle experience. But how would you try to communicate uh, what the goals or how it, the experience of being in a circle uh, for someone who hasn't, hasn't been in one? It could be either of you, I didn't. Didn't mean to look right at your bedroom. With your experience yeah. and some of your peers. Sure. Um, <coughs> uh, so we, one of the first like circles that we did was with DW and Eveline, and we did a, It was a circle about where we where we come from and who who are our people was the question that prompted us. So what happens is in the beginning we sit in a circle and like everyone's in the circle. No one's like sitting outside or watching. Everyone's in there and present. Um, in the middle, there is a um, centerpiece, which is um, in our room. It's a cloth with uh, certain things on it, with the rules, like the guidelines for the circle. Which is, um, I, I'm not completely sure about them, but they're kind of like, like respect who's talking and listen, and um, everyone should be heard. And if you um, and respect the talking piece, which is um, the like a piece of um, an object that someone would bring in and it has some type of uh, meaning to them and so like sharing like sharing that story like what that object has meaning for like adds meaning to it and so everyone respects that and when you have the talking piece you're invited to talk and share your story and when you don't have it you're invited to listen and hear what other people are saying um, and so with that circle we each of us would tell it uh, tell the group about our stories and where we came from where our families come from and it, like, it's really powerful because it wasn't just like, okay, I'm from, my family comes from Uganda and I, um, they immigrated here. It's like you're going really, really, really deep into it and to why, like, and it was emotional for a lot of people and, and just watching other people got, it got me emotional sometimes. And I think um, it really brought us together. So now when we meet, like the day after, we were like, oh, we're like a really big group together who's supporting each other and know each other a little bit better so we can make the world a better place, so, yeah. Thank you for the, giving that tangible example. I yeah. think that's really helpful for yeah. people to hear. Um, one of the interesting things as the work has continued is um, even outside the high school, I was at a faculty meeting on a completely different topic and they used some of the circle methodologies in a way to ensure that all, um, this was a staff faculty meeting, so all staff members would have their voices heard and would have um, the ability to participate in equal and, and uh, open met ways. And you know, I've shared this publicly, I mean, it was such an interesting experience for me as an observer, um, to the point where it got so intimate, even though the conversation was not nearly as deep as what you just described, that I actually walked out, because I felt like I was, if I wasn't a participant, you know, it wasn't really the right thing to observe, because um, while people weren't sharing personal stories about themselves, they were sharing their opinions on a specific topic, um, just the circle, the methodology that went along with it, I could see how much the individuals were connecting, and since I wasn't part of that circle, Actually, I, I decided, I opted to let that 
work continue without me observing. It just didn't feel like the right moment to be there. Um, and, and certainly that's how I've felt in the couple of times I've been in the circle process as a participant, is the, the way that people are communicating with another and connecting with one another feels substantially different than casual conversations that um, we're in most of our lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to put into context, I mean, the wholeness of a circle is that we are all equal. It's, there's no points, there's no um, angles. We are whole, and so sitting in a circle and having the opportunity to be seen as you're speaking and not be able to hide in the shadows or to listen and fully be present, there's a power in that and um, the ability to build that level of trust. And I'm glad you brought that up because when I facilitate circles, there are no observers allowed. And I know you're the superintendent. <laughs> you would be invited in because of that reason. Yeah. Um, there's the power of what happens in circle is in circle and, and the commitment of those in the circle to show up fully and wholly um, and, and to be able to connect does provide an opportunity to have a different type of conversation versus sort of moving around or you're sitting in rows and you can't even see who's behind you and, and being able to be whole together. Um, and just going back to your question around, let me see, what was it? Yeah. Yeah. Just about the circle process. The circle yeah. process and, and that depth of, um, humanity that comes into it moves beyond sort of just like who we are in the surface and what Petwa explained um, was about proper introduction and as we function in the world there's not often many opportunities to be properly to properly introduce ourselves or to be properly introduced and received as we are holy um, and you know for the students that was a, it was a huge learning curve because they've never been in a school building and actually connected with one another they go to class they listen to the teacher they might do a group project that's just based on this and then they move but there was a lot of value um in being able to connect with the other human <laughs> that's across the room or maybe has been in my class since my freshman year and i'm a senior and i finally get to know who this person is and they speak for themselves it's not a label it's not you know what someone else says of them but they be able to articulate who they are and you know in many situations that we've been able to share in class they've seen each other either through middle school or high school and there's a lot of assumptions that go an implicit bias that goes on with those people those students but to be able to define and speak from your own voice has been a really powerful um, has been a that comes with that power and what allows us to be able to restore when that is lost when there's a disconnect in community and being able to come back to that wholeness is really a lot of the power of the circle. Yeah, thank you. So Petra, I want to start with you with this one, just in terms of what impact do you think the restorative justice work has had on you know, either yourself or the participants, um, both in the school, but maybe even beyond the school setting? I think like the community that I've created with the, my fellow students in that class and the teachers that are in there that are also like a part of that class, they make it they the relationships I have with them in, especially in that class is like so powerful like I know them on a different level than I would know if I was like sitting in class as Evelyn was saying like I know like it's not like I see them in class and I'm like oh they're in my grade or that I like know them and I know their stories and I know that I can trust them because I shared my stories and I there is not that there wasn't any judgment but everyone was open to hearing what I was saying and um, I, that I think that adds a different level of like comfort um, to know that I have that in the school and to know that I have a place where I can be like I can tell say that I'm like not feeling really good today and I don't want to really like learn today I want to play Uno like one time we played Uno because we were all stressed with finals and everything and it was really relaxing and but other days we talk heated conversations about like um like whether having um uh, taking honors classes will help you get to the college or anything and I think like all of, like having that kind of relationship with um, certain people is so is so amazing and um, nice and comforting to know that you can have that opportunity and then out of the school when I don't see them I can see if I see problems in my classes or if I see problems with the other people uh, my friends or let's say like um, one of uh, Rachita she has a uh, she's a student in my class she had a conflict with her friend one time and um, the, her friends, no, her friends were having conflict with each other and she was stuck in the middle of it. And she had, this was really early on in the, the sort of justice class. And she already knew that she, she could be like someone who would listen to both sides and try to find like the root of the problem instead of like the nitty gritty stuff. So it really helped bring their relationship together. And Regita said that her friends noticed that she has, was changing already. And this was early, early in the um, semester. And now we're like in the second semester and I think that many people around us like see the change that we have 
individually and how we've um, opened up ourselves because of the circles that we've had and because of all of the um, things that we've learned. And I think that's how it's affected me and affected the class. And I, I just, I'm glad that I've been able to do that. Yeah, and uh, like one time for my basketball season, um, we, um, we have to like, we one time, um, some of the, to my um, teammates, they said that they wanted to kneel for the national anthem. I'm like, okay, I'll do that too. And then the first time I did it, I didn't really think about why I knelt for the national anthem. But then after that, I was like, okay, I understand that I'm doing this to like support um, like police reform and all of that. And um, then one game there was a, uh, the crowd was like saying derogatory terms at us and everything. And we lost the game and they're like, okay, you should have uh, stood for the flag and maybe that's why you would have won. And it was really, it shook all of us, but because we had, I, I had talked to them about why we did this. And the day after we talked about with the whole team, JV and varsity, it like helped um, us grow together as a community. And we need all of us, like a lot of us kneeled for the rest of the season. And the people that stood were like, I stand because like my family fought in the war and they're like, we have nothing um, against that. And we are here to support each other. And I think that communication is key. And I think that was rooted partly in because of my restorative justice work and how I was able to open myself up to that vulnerability with my teammates. So that's how it's affected me. Yeah. yeah. Well, those are incredibly uh, evocative stories of, mm -hmm. of uh, thank you for sharing those yes. uh, with us and with the community because I think they really show about the growth that and what you've taken from mm -hmm. the restorative practice and, and restorative justice work and also how you've been able to implement that in other settings, which is uh, really what we want to do. I mean, it's wonderful for um, students to have this amazing experience, but what I heard is that it's affecting you when you're not in circle mm -hmm. with Evelyn or with EW that you're able to translate those skills into other settings. So mm -hmm. thank you and thank you for your leadership on those yeah. some really critical issues that you described. Mm -hmm. Um, so how would you like to see, you know, in either of you could jump in, uh, restorative justice work growing uh, in the future years um, in the district? What are some ways that you could think about uh, how what you just described could be shared by more students and, and uh, affect the community in even greater ways? Um, yeah, my dream is that all students feel that way. They feel powerful in their own power and in their own voice and experience and that the culture of our schools be places um, where not only students but adults have a notion of harmony and a notion of value of all of us in the building or all of us in the community um, and, and the beauty of that, um, of, of the culture, how we function. Um, my children go to Wildwood and they've been, you know, that wasn't they're not jumping on the bandwagon saying this is how we're now doing it. They have been doing it for many years and you can feel it in the building. You can feel it in the young people that are coming through that school. And those are, that's the only one I have experienced. I haven't really experienced the other two elementary schools. And now I'm working at the middle school and um, as a climate and culture coordinator and being able to begin to start to educate the community and be able to start to um, have opportunities, and I can give a perfect example, um, two young people who are friends get in an altercation with each other. Light, one says something, the other one punches, the other one pushes, and then that's it. Um, and the first reaction for many folks in the building was, oh, they should get suspended, they got in a big fight. And I was like, um, excuse me, along with the principals understanding the value of restorative justice to say, would it, be op would, it, would it be possible for you to sit with them in circle and, and have an opportunity? I bring them in, I sit down with them. They're friends. They had a discord. And within minutes of my explaining why, what I do and how I do it and create the space, one turns to the other. I want to apologize for the way I made you feel. I know that wasn't right. And you know now we're here because of that comment that I made. And I'm sorry that I, I you know, and parents had been called. So the, right. you know, the impact of this goes further and the other one says I'm sorry I punched you I should have thought better of, of my reaction blah 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 but within 15 minutes to those young people be able to connect and to acknowledge one another and acknowledge where there was a disconnect and then move on their merry way as friends is really the power of what I would love to continue to see in our schools of discord happens disconnect happens sometimes in very ugly ways, whether it's between adults, between students. How do we find a place to say, 
that happens and acknowledge what was that and also start to learn about what needs are not being met in, in our environments, particularly in our schools and with our students. So really, I would love to see a culture shift in our whole district moving toward that with the value given that when you're at your best and I'm at my best, we can do great things. And I think that Amherst has a lot of wonderful things happening, but as a community, we really can grow into that value of each individual that's in our system. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, I think that, that um, it also makes me think about, um, you know, whether the sum is greater than the individual part, right? That whole piece mm -hmm. that we do have so many strengths in our community and yet we have so much work to do. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. if we don't do it together, the work's not going to get done. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate uh, the lens that both of you shared. Um, anything else, final comments before we close the show that you'd like to share about your experience? I think um, some of the next steps that our, our class is taking yeah, is please. soon going to take is like we're going to try to like set ourselves up to do the circle process in um, the middle school and work because Evelyn's in the middle school so right. it would work a lot easier and to get because the middle school a lot of the harm that happens in the middle school carries over into the high school so working in the middle school and working with like circles community building circles mainly just like having classes come in and like talk to each other for a while and um, and even if we get to that like um, conflict circles where like watch how she gave an example with the um, two kids that had an altercation like bringing that circles there we're planning on having our uh, student le leaders do that and um, I'm looking forward to that and then I think one of the things that could happen in the future is like advisory in our school we have advisory like once a month every uh, every like for every year that I've been here and um, advisory seems to be a time where you like like get a lot of things put into your brain and it just go and then it's, there's no connection I think advisory is one of you stay with your advisory for the four years right. that you're there so I think impl implementing a um, circle process into advisory would be really helpful to make it more meaningful because a lot of students, like, they want it to be meaningful, but they don't know what's going on and why it's not working because it's just like a game plan and you have to go, 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 and then you, maybe you watch a movie at the end. And, uh, but, so I think uh, implementing circle process into advisory would be really um, great and would be able to get the whole school doing it, not just like a select, like, 10 people that are in my class that are into right. the whole school doing it. So. And Great. the teachers as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, I think, unfortunately, we're out of time. I know we could keep talking <laughs> about this, and I'd yeah. continue to learn, which would be wonderful. But I really want to thank both of you for coming on the show um, today and sharing the great work that's happening uh, at the high school with our larger community. Mm -hmm. So yes. thank yeah. you. I want to thank you, the viewer, too, for coming and learning more about the Amherst Pelham Regional School District. We'll be back soon with the next episode, and hope you have a wonderful day.